All right, here with Jack Warren, uh, the godfather of baseball podcasting, uh, top coach podcast, and owner of Corn Belt Sports. So, Jack, I'm excited to have you on. Thanks for being here. Ryan, I am so excited to be on. You, you guys mean a lot to me. Uh, I'll always love what you guys do and what you give back to the game. So I think you guys are like the beacon of uh, amateur baseball. That's for sure. Yeah. And this, uh, this will be our 300th uh, episode uh, between uh, Jeremy and I doing this. Um, and so I wanted to have you on to kind of say thank you. And uh, you are the original baseball podcast. I uh, listened and, and still listen to a lot of your, your top coach podcasts. So thanks for everything that you've done for, for baseball podcasting. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, what do you wish uh, someone would have told you before you got into podcasting? Um, well, it's there's a lot of things I didn't know. Most of them have turned out to be really good uh, because I think you've probably found this out, Ryan. That you you create relationships and and learn things that you never would have known before. Uh, I guess anything that I wish I would have known, maybe been from the technical standpoint, things like that. But I, I got to tell you, it's 95% like having Christmas Day every time I do something like this. So, you know, it's it's not one of those things when I ask a question to a coach, what what didn't you know when you were a player that you, you know, you found out after you started coaching? And the answer usually comes down to, man, all the time you have to spend behind a desk planning and all this other stuff and things like that. But uh, I pretty much knew what I was getting into. And most of the things have been gifts to me beyond that. You know, and, and you helped me so much in the beginning when I got here, because I knew nothing about it. And, um, you know, you helped, Jeremy had helped. And I, I think the biggest one tip wise that you told me was that if you're spending a lot of time editing, you're doing it wrong in the recording process. Absolutely. And so that that's always stuck with me that if you can get things right on the front end, it saves you a lot of work on the back end. Um, and for anybody that's that's thinking about getting into this, YouTube is going to be your best friend with YouTube tutorials. Yeah. Well, you know, Ryan, you're, you're exactly right. And I learned that more every day. I appreciate it. I, I doubt that I spend, uh, I, I don't spend any time. There's it's rare in the almost 400 interviews that we've done that I go back in and start clipping things out in the middle. I chop off the beginning where we're chit chatting before I say, let's go. And I chop off the end and that's it. And then I start adding things to it. But yeah, I, I think we tend to overthink it a little bit. And anybody who's thinking about doing something like that, maybe just for your team that you're, you're, you're doing it, don't overthink it because it's like a conversation. Keep it like a conversation. And then when you're done, I think you're going to be satisfied with product. Don't, don't overproduce because you'll, you'll end up hating what you do then. Yep, yep for sure. Um, you know, I, I think there's two avenues you can kind of take and, you know, I think you want to get it right, but if you spend too much time trying to get it right, you're going to wear yourself out. And and really, it's about putting good content out into the world, and and that's it. And just let the viewers decide if if they enjoy it or not. And you really can't worry about if people are enjoying it or not. You're just going to put good content out into the world. Yeah, there there is one exception, and this is usually what leads to what I would call right now uh, internal editing and that is within the course of the interview and that is uh, I tell the coaches up front when I talk to them I said my job is to make you look good I don't want to stump you I don't want to ask you a question where you appear stumped or I don't want to put you in a position where you're talking about a third rail topic that you're not supposed to talk about so if keeping that in mind when I get in there if I do kind of stump them or if 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 for some reason, occasionally somebody who's really uncomfortable on the air, who does not get interviewed a lot, some of these small town coaches, some high school coaches, junior high coaches that I've interviewed, they're not, they're not doing media interviews. And so if they feel a little uncomfortable, number one, I try to make them feel comfortable before we ever hit the record button. Number two, if they end up maybe stuttering or, or hemming and hawing around, I'll go in and clean that up a little bit because I know 
I, I don't want them to think, oh man, I, I, I wish I would have had another chance to do that or something like that. My biggest one is, is I get so excited and I want people to clarify. And, and so I try to let the guests talk and then get their statement out. But I do jump in maybe a little quick at times. So that's one of the things that I've had to work on more than anything is making sure that I'm not jumping in too quick and, and cutting people off with, with the conversation. Well, there's two things going on there. Now, you, Ryan, being a former coach uh, at Division One level, you understand you, you, they'll say something that'll spark something in your mind. You're like, oh, oh, I've, I've got something to say here, forgetting <laughs> that they're the guest, okay? And sometimes it is good. And, and another thing that it's play there is some coaches will start to ramble a little bit. And our job as a good host is to try to keep them between the – between the rails for one thing, but interject occasionally, not because what they're saying is not good content. Cause a lot of coaches could speak for an hour uninterrupted without any help from us and be good, but it's just in the form of an audio podcast. It's good to hear another voice interject on occasion to at least say, uh-huh. Yes. And what do you think? What would you do to follow up on that or something like that? How long did it take you to find your voice? I mean, how how many episodes in did you feel like okay, I, I've got this, I got this going? Well, you know, I I I think when I had first had this idea in 2013, I remember I was on a dog walk along Old Route 66 in Central Illinois, there dead ending, and I was about as far away from my home as I get on my dog walk, and it just occurred to me what I need to do, and I ran home. The first person I called was Mark Kingston and I ran this idea by him, but I said, here's the deal. I don't want to teach coaching. Number one, I, I'm not equipped to do that. Number two, there, there, there's people who are so much better at that than me. I want to talk to coaches about their career, about their organization. And I think early on, I, I, it, it, I, I tried too hard to have a set of questions that were the same and it didn't feel right. I think it took me at least, it sounds pretty quick now that I think about it, but at least five or six episodes, because you'll hear the first, the first episode I did with Tracy Smith, who was in Indiana at the time. And then I moved through a couple others and we we're going, I finally started to see what was working, what was not working, mostly by the reaction of my guests, the way the comfort level wasn't there. What I wanted it to sound like was sitting in the Opryland Hotel at 11 o'clock at night on Friday after all the convention stuff is done and you're sitting there chatting. That's what I want it to sound like. Yeah, you've done a phenomenal job with that. Um, Andy Lopez, I was going to ask you kind of your favorites. Andy Lopez was probably my favorite one of the, the older versions of ones, just because he reminded me of my dad so much just with his story and his upbringing. So Andy's probably was my favorite one that you did. Andy Lopez was great. And it, it's funny. Uh, every now and then I have to look up to say, did I actually interview this guy or did I just think about interviewing this guy at one point and I'll go back and look at my complete list of interviews. Oh, oh yeah, I did interview him. But the thing I remember and the reason why I think top coach works is because of the stories that are being told. I think that's the best way to learn. And right now, even though I interviewed Andy Lopez in 2013 or 2014, I still remember four or five of the stories that he told, because to me, that's the single best way to learn. If you want to learn history, learn it with stories. Yep. If you want to learn coaching and the coaching profession, learn it with stories. You don't have to remember the three R's or the, I'm going to tell you all these points starting with P for pitching here. Um, when Andy Lopez told those stories, and I still remember him talking about driving around Long Beach, looking for people, for kids playing wiffle ball. Okay. There's a point to that story, but the story is memorable. He uh, he came on. I did father and son. You know, when the pandemic hit, we were just kind of scrambling to try to get content out, and so I did a father and son series. So he was on there uh, and and did a phenomenal job. I had had a little interaction with him, but not much. But you know, to your point, I, 
there's so many great stories out there. Um, and when I'm, when I'm digging in to ask questions, I try to tailor questions towards someone's background and their upbringing. Cause I think that helps them bring, it brings comfort to them because you're going to give them some layups early so that they're comfortable and they can kind of get in the flow of, of the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. I try to use the few minutes before we hit the record button to get them in the comfort mode because Actually, early on, before anybody ever heard a top coach, I, I'd be this just guy calling from central Illinois who's saying, hey, I want to talk to you about something. And I think almost everybody thought, well, he's going to ask me, how's your team looking this year? What, what's, uh, you know, what are some changes in the program that are going on? Then when they find out, when I start with, tell me about growing up. And I still remember to this day, Tracy Smith, talking about the town he grew up there in Indiana. And we shared a common, I talked to him about an ice cream place that I knew was on the corner of a route that we always turned on there. We got talking about that. I remember him talking about his dad being a barber, things like that. Not only, not only make the guests feel more comfortable, it makes the listener feel like they're listening in on a conversation and, and it endears them to the whole subject. You know, you took a little bit of a pause there and, and then you're back and I'm so happy that you're back. But how did you know when it was time to maybe take a little bit of a pause? Well, we made a big move to Florida yep. and the, it was complicated by the fact that uh, we knew our time in central Illinois was done. We we narrowed our choices down. We were going to move to East Tennessee. In fact, we had we were this close to buying a house in East Tennessee and then my wife developed a complication with uh, the sight in her right eye. And it all of a sudden we figured out this is not going to work for her driving on these curvy mountain roads of East Tennessee. And so we went to plan B, which was moving down to uh, Northeast Florida. And for all of you guys in the Northeast and in the East Coast who've taken I-95 down, Cross the Georgia Florida line. If you as soon as you cross that line, take an immediate left. That's where I live. So, little town called Fernandina Beach, Florida, near Jacksonville. But that was so it was kind of uh, everything that was going on at the time. Uh, I, I can never say that I reached a point of burnout because that never happens. Every time a coach picks up on the phone on the other end and says, Let's get going, it just fires me up. So I'll tell you this, Ryan, it was my wife who at least once a week said, when are you going to start doing this again? When are you going to start? She's been my biggest supporter. She's never listened to a single podcast. She, 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 it's like watching her kids play sports or doing a play. She wants to watch, but she's over and, oh, please let this go. So the same thing. She's never listened, but she's been my biggest encourager and she, just was at me relentlessly saying, when are you starting this up again? When are you doing this again? And I said, I'm going to do it. And so now I'm back in with both feet again and, and uh, going a hundred miles an hour. Love it. Yeah. My parents are in Pensacola now they moved full time. So it's, they've been down there about three years and they wouldn't go back to Illinois now, now that they've been in Pensacola for this long. There's no, no, no. no. When it, yeah. In January, when it gets all the way down to 47 here, and I'll, I'll ask some of the people that I know, I say, you know what we call this in central Illinois? It's called baseball weather. Yes, it is. You uh, know that well, Ryan. Hey, what are some common themes that you're seeing? Uh, you, you've you interviewed so many successful coaches, a bunch of different sports. I mean, what are some of the common themes that you're seeing out of the coaches that are successful? Well, you know, I, I have to point back to one of the earlier the probably the earliest interview I did with Dan McDonald and because everybody quotes it, everybody says the same thing, but he lived it. First of all, again, I'm thinking just, just mentioning the name. I'm thinking of his stories. I'm thinking of him talking about, you know, the, getting turned down for five uh, head coaching positions before he got it. And his brother telling him, you know, you need to change your style. And he said, no, I want them to see what they're getting. So you, you bring back all these stories, but he, really preaches be where your feet are and i still remember and you you probably seen it on the social media that i take four or five of the quotes that the guys do and i put it on their picture and put it on social media and that's one of them it says be where your feet are and i think everybody has some 
form of that statement that they have, but he lived it. He preaches it. It's a common theme with him. And you hear it with a lot of coaches. And that is, you know, do the best job where you are. Uh, so many guys look down the road so far that they leave behind what they're doing currently. So that's, the, that's, that's really the, the one thing that jumps out at me. Uh, another thing that has become clear, even if it's not stated, is that there is no one path to get where you want to go. I guess that's preceded by make sure you know where you want to go because a lot of guys are finding out these days. They used to think the dream job was a, a division one job. I talk to so many guys now uh, who, who are in division two, II, division three in AIA or a junior college job and find out, you know what? I love this is every bit as competitive and it, it fulfills what I'm looking to do in my life. And so along those lines, again, getting back to the previous one, and there's no one path. And as we talked to Eddie Smith just a couple of weeks ago, he took an unusual path to get to where he's at now at Utah Valley. And, and there are so many different uh, paths. Um, but one of the things, and I know a lot of the younger guys look at this and they, they listen to some of the seasoned guys who talk about contentment. They talk about work-life balance. They talk about contentment. And they sometimes they don't take them serious because they think, oh, well, that's because you got where you wanted to go. That's as we No, it's not. Sometimes, you know, if you're a younger guy, look to some of these guys and understand their path may have been a little bit different, but they learned a lot over the years. And what they're saying carries a lot of weight and listen to what they say about being content. Listen to what they say about work-life balance. Uh, listen to what Tim Corbin has to say when he's talking about, he did a great episode with us on nothing but communication. And that's one thing that was so important to him. And he lives it in everything that he does and he practices what he preaches. So, uh, I mean, boy, I could go on and on about the I, common. I think Eddie Smith is a great example of, surrounding yourself with successful people because he had a paid job went to be a volunteer went to be ops guy because of pulmonary and i think eddie's a really good example of not taking a step back but hitching yourself to successful people because you know it's going to lead to something pretty good down the road well who is all the business speakers the guys who go out there and lecture on the business circuits talk about that you're going to be the what the average of the five people yep. you surround yourself with but I look at that sometime from the negative side is you, you need to eject some of those people who are negative, who are constantly draining you down, but also on the positive side. Yeah. You know, like Eddie Smith did surround yourself with very successful people because good things happen when you start to, when you start to do that. Um, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about uh, a multitude of counselors. And I know that I've told my youngest son, who's still back in central Illinois and he, he finished graduate school and he's out on doing his stuff now. But the one thing that he's always taken to heart, I said, Alex, look, whenever you have a decision to make, make sure that number one, you have seasoned counselors that you can go to and ask for their advice. And I said, also bounce it off your friends and stuff. It doesn't mean you have to take the advice. It means you, it, you should at least listen to what people have to say because they're going to say something you never thought of before. And I think that hopefully that's what's happening with top coach is that the young coaches, the aspiring coaches, they, even the seasoned guys will look and say, you know, I never thought of it that way before. You're doing some coaching mentoring now, which is, is phenomenal. So what are some other tips that you're trying to give some of the young coaches that are calling you? Well, it is funny because the last three or four months I've opened it up to where I'm giving away a, a free coaching session for young coaches, and I'm absolutely loving it. Loving it. it was kind of spurred on by a Division I assistant coach out in California who called me out of the blue and said, I just want – he said, I'm doing – during the COVID thing, he was doing a research project, and he said, I want – he said, I was calling all these coaches individually, and then I realized – he said, you've talked to hundreds of thousands of coaches. He said, I'll just talk to you. 
And we ended up having a two hour conversation and then another one after that. And I realized I was learning more from this guy, I think, than he was learning from me. And so I, I've kind of reached out to some of these younger guys and said, you know what, I'm going to offer one free session to somebody each month because I, I think I'm helping them out a little bit, but it keeps me sharp. And I find out what are these young guys talking about? And, and some of the common themes, again, have to do with career. Uh, that with the younger guys, and, and it just stands to reason, it's going to be about career. Uh, it is going to be how do I get from point A to point B? What things do I consider? There are a lot of coaches out there right now that I feel, I feel uh, humbled that I was able to help out a little bit in getting them into a position where they're at now. And, and it, uh, some of that has to do with just the fact that I can make some connections sometime. And sometimes I know about things uh, where there's an opening where somebody doesn't know about it or some guy that need, has told me, I need something here. Do you know somebody like that? And that's helpful. But the young guys are always looking for how do I get a lot of them too have asked, I don't know where I want to go. All I know is I want to do this and helping them sort through that. I feel like a high school or college counselor, you know, is, is here, here's some things you need to think about because Ryan, you probably know a hundred of these guys who thought they were for sure wanting to take that division one route only to find out what was involved in it. And they think, am I willing to do that? And, and being a seasoned guy like you are and the other people, you know, when you can say, look, here's what you have to think about. I'm not telling you what to do, but here's what you have to think about. And then that's what the young guys with the, the older guys I talk to a lot of the time it just comes down to organizational matters because, um, uh, you know, when you see your favorite pizza joint where people were standing in line to, to go get the pizza and you couldn't figure out, wait a second, why is there a closed sign on there now? Why are they no longer in business? It usually doesn't come down to the pizza it comes down to running a business. Why farmers fail sometimes. It's not because they don't know how to plant corn. It's because they don't know how to run a business. And so one of the things I end up talking with the more seasoned coaches about, or think about the ability to step back and look at your program like a scout would look at your program, okay? And say, what are the areas where I'm failing right now? What are the areas where I'm doing well? And it doesn't have Typically, it's not usually about bunt defenses or your bullpen sessions. It has to do with communication, organization, uh, delegation, things like that. And so those are the topics we get into with some of the more seasoned guys. Yeah, the, that's a big one is <clears throat> understanding what it takes at each job to be successful, because a lot of people don't understand that piece. And if you want to be a head division one coach, that's fine, but reach out to head division one coaches and actually find out what they do. I think that that's a big part of inexpensive experience is reaching out to someone that's in the field that you want to be in and ask them questions, what they like about it, what they don't like about it. Cause people are going to be honest with you on that. And I think you can save yourself some headaches along the path is just reaching out to people that are in positions that you want to be in, um, you know, and, and Absolutely. backing up to Dan McDonald, the big one for me with him was how prepared he was for the jobs that he went after and the binder, the binder piece was big and I still use the binder and that, that helped me along the way. And that was a big one that stuck out with Dan McDonald's was his binder on, on how he was going to run the program. I think that's what set him apart on some jobs. Yeah, what it does is it forces you to, it actually forces you to um, make a, to verbalize. Yeah. Uh, I was looking for the right word there. To, <laughs> surprising. You, well, yeah, you have to clarify what yeah. you want from your program. When you start to put things, Ryan, into your binder, you have to think about it, okay? Because I think a lot of people think, and this was the old thing where you think, uh, okay, I'm going to take the best guy on my team, uh, my star shortstop, and he'll be my next coach. He'll help me coach. And I think, no, no, no. It's, it's like corporations, uh, one of which I worked for, where, where middle management sometimes is the weak point. 
because sometimes they'll think, oh, this guy is really good at what he does. He'll be a good manager. Well, no, that's not true. Uh, not necessarily true. It, it, it can be true, but quite often there, there are people overlook those skills that go into be becoming a good manager. So you're right. You need to start talking uh, to some of these guys who've been around a while. And guess what? The beauty of baseball is they're all willing to talk to you. Uh, just as an aside, I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day who asked me, you know, about some of the interviews I do. And I said, I, yeah, I'm trying to get other coaches to come in and do this, but you know, I could, I don't think I could do this with football. I don't think I could do this with basketball because when I pick up the phone and call Jim Schlossnagel, he'll say yes. So I have to be careful The the four times that I've called Tim Corbin, he says yes. So I have to be careful about that because they do say yes. They always say yes. And, and football coaches, I can't even get a hold of them. The basketball coaches have to go through the SID, can't get a hold of them. And uh, so they're so anyway. guarded. I mean, and I have good friends that coach college and football. They're just so much they're they're guarded more than baseball guys. Well, let me let me tell you a funny story. And it, this is everybody who's listening right now who has uh, been on one of my interviews or 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 on top coach or just talk to me understands I chase a lot of rabbits. So <laughs> when you open a door and you probably notice on a top coach interview, what started going down you know, I-95 all of a sudden ended up on US-17 because they opened a door and I went through the door and it was interesting what was behind the door. But uh, I, you just brought to mind something. And that was two, probably two times ago when we were at the Opryland Hotel for the ABCA convention, which I might, uh, you guys no shortage of plugging it, but I tell you is the single best thing I look forward to every year. I love the convention. It's like, it's like an old time family reunion. Love Charges it. Charges your it. batteries. It does recharge oh the goodness. batteries. Yeah. Anybody, let me put in a plug right now. This is, this is <laughs> Appreciate it. But I just want to tell you if you're on the fence at all and Nashville coming up is, is except for the guys in California and Utah, it's easy to get to. Yeah. So, well, it's even easy from California. Jump on a plane. You'll be in Nashville in no time, but it's the single best thing you're going to do all year. If you're on the fence, you will not regret it, even if, like last convention I went to, did not even make it into the lecture hall one time. I was because I was so busy talking to people. But anyway, uh, back to my other story. Hey, Two I was going to ask you though, who nudged you to get into the ABCA? Who who nudged you to join? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not even sure. I can't even remember right now how that happened. But yeah, best one of the it's best coaching decision I ever made. Best coaching decision. Yeah. All right. So but, back, back to football and basketball yeah, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you remember where I was at. So good. I'll have to hire you to make uh, <laughs> notes for me. But no, I, two times ago, I think it was we were in Nashville or maybe three times ago. I was talking to one of the guys who, who was an exhibitor there at, at the in the convention hall. And he just happened to be whatever product was he sold i don't even remember but he was at the football convention that was there not long before that and he said i'm going to tell you the difference between football coaches and baseball coaches and i said okay he said here's the deal he said uh i was walking through the bar he said with the uh football convention and i noticed two coaches sitting at a table and they pulled out a napkin and one coach was diagramming a play for the other coach and said when he was done diagramming the play, he picked it up and put it in his pocket. He said, that's football coaches. He said, baseball coaches. And then he pointed and looked around and there were several older guys with younger guys stopping to talk to him. And I have the famous kind of, I call it famous. I, the, I think it, it's famous on my website because it got a lot of comma, comments. Eric Backage standing in Indianapolis. I have a picture of him. He was standing there for 15 minutes. He was writing things down for this young coach and spending time with him. That's baseball coaches. And that's the difference between baseball coaches and the other sports. Is Na Nashville your favorite? I mean, I think it's everybody's favorite spot. Oh, hands down. Well, you know, there's so many reasons why. 
Uh, and some of them I, I won't mention because it gets into negative parts about some of the others. But number one, Nashville is easy to get to. Number two, for young coaches, they can walk across the street and go to McDonald's to eat and not break the budget. And then it's just a cool atmosphere where you go from one place to another. And I'm not even talking about some of the stuff where some of the guys will go into downtown and do things like that. But just the setup of the convention hall, uh, the proximity to things you can do, uh, the great rate that you guys get on fabulous rooms. Uh, my wife always has to come along. We have the whole thing this year for the first time ever, which is, is insane to think about. We're going to be the only you ones mean, there this year. You mean no, no girl cheerleaders? No dancing, line, championship line dancing. Dancers, <laughs> line dancers. I think the last time we were there it was line dancers. Yes. And, and, yeah, and then the uh, cheerleader. There's always cheerleaders at every – or whatever those cheer squad things are. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned seasoned counselors. How do you know when when you have the right mentors or finding the right mentors? How do you go about doing that? Well, number, you know, I, I think uh, a, a couple of years ago, I was passing, I was making a road trip where I came back through and I got to attend a staff meeting at the University of Kentucky. That was great. And then I stopped at uh, Georgia Gwinnett College with when Sheets had just first taken over. And he, he, Pops this on me real quick. He goes, how about speaking to the guys for five minutes? I, uh, you know, one thing talking to some coaches or talking one-on-one -on -one with people, but you know, I got a bunch of young players here, but to your point, I, I said, you know what? I'm going to talk to them about hacks for, for gaining wisdom because it's difficult when you're a 19, 20, 21 year old guy to, it's easy to get smarts. It's hard to get wisdom. But the number one way is to surround yourself with wise people, with people who you know who've, who've got it. Just because you're old doesn't mean you're wise. And so one of the tips I remember telling him, I said, one of the telltale signs is somebody who tells you how, how smart they are or how wise they are, uh, those are the ones you want to avoid, okay? I said, the, the real easy way to do it look to who everybody else is going to, because guess what? After a while, it's like a restaurant. After a while, everybody's going to get it. This is not the place to go. And so there's a reason why everybody calls Tim Corbin. And I, I can't imagine, you know, every time that I'd send him a text, he would text me back at five o'clock in the morning. So I figured that's his routine that he does it at five o'clock. Well, I said, and, and then I'll have some high school coach from Georgia who will tell me, yeah, when I was talking to Tim Corbin last week, and I said, I said, hey, he must be on everybody's phone in the ABCA, all 10 or 11,000 members or whatever you guys got now. He must be on everybody's phone. Well, there's a reason why it's there. But you don't overlook, you're a young guy, and let's say you're in the middle of Iowa, okay? Don't overlook the guy at the Division Three school who's been coaching for 20 years. That's a good place to start. There's a reason why he's been there for 20 years. There, there's a reason why, and, and don't look at his record and say, oh, well, he's never been to the College World Series. That doesn't mean anything. Anybody who's listened to any of your podcast, any of the podcasts that I've done, you'll, you'll tell real quick, you'll say, J uh, just like um, uh, Jim Page at Millsaps College, okay? He, he tells that great story where he says, uh, a friend of his was bragging on him one day and said, Jim, man, you you said what you've achieved and what you've been able to get done here and everything like that. You're probably better than most division one uh, coaches. And he, Jim said, I was feeling really puffed up at that point. He said, and there's probably 500 high school coaches who are better than you. <laughs> he said, that's right. He said, that's exactly right. So don't overlook every day. I'm surprised. Um, when I uncover another coach, because I always love to find some of these gyms who've and I'll point back to Cal Bailey. Cal Bailey was one of the best series of interviews I've ever done. And when people ask me, I'm going on a road trip and I want to listen. I said, well, what are you looking for? I'll kind of, but one of the go-to things I say, listen to these interviews with Cal Bailey. The funny thing about it, Cal Bailey coached at, you know, West Virginia state division two for a long time. 
how many people don't know who Cal Bailey is? And I say, listen to this interview with Cal Bailey. If you want to must listen, listen to Cal Bailey, uh, listen to his interviews. But there's guys like that all over the place. And you know what? You'll find out soon enough when you're talking to them whether what they're feeding you is, is, is nonsense or whether it's wise. You, you, you'll find out. And most of the time, it's preceded by humility. Yeah, I just I, I, I've said this a lot lately. We have some guys retiring that have been at places for a long time. You look at Woody Hunt last year and Ron Scott this year. And what do you feel like the key to longevity is staying in it? Coaching is, is extremely hard, especially at the college level. What do you feel like the key to longevity is? Well, it's one of the topics that's coming up uh, a lot lately. And you, you asked me before about com common themes. One of them is longevity, um, especially at the high school level now, you know, I'm old enough to remember the, the stereotype of the coach in the gray sweats with a whistle around his neck. And he'd been coaching for 30 years. You don't see that anymore. Now, you, Ryan, you're familiar with the area where I was from there in uh, where I'd lived for the last 20 years in, in Bloomington, normal Illinois. They're fortunate at their five major high schools that all of those coaches have been there 10 to 20 years. And that's unusual. That's very unusual because what you're more likely to see right now is you're more likely to see a young guy. You think he's a rising star. The next year you see, wait, he's not coaching anymore. No, now he's assistant principal or now he's uh, doing something else, but the pressures are incredible. Now on the college level, I think it comes down to a couple things. I think it comes down to finding the right fit. What, what are your ultimate goals as a coach? What, what are you looking to achieve? Not, not athletically necessarily, but your whole thing. If you're, if you're hoping to have a family with four kids and, and, and all that, you might rethink whether the Division I route is right for you. Because, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell you a great interview. One of my favorite interviews on this very subject where we touched on this subject was with Ed Flaherty, Southern Maine. Because there is a point in the interview, because Ed talks about the fact that he was offered at least three times Division I jobs and turned them down. But he said he, I asked him at one point towards the inter, end of the interview, man, and this is years ago, and it still ring, it just resonates in my head. I said, Ed, do you have any regrets? And he paused and he goes, no regrets. He said, I got to watch my sons play high school baseball. And I make an okay amount of money. No, no regrets. Just like that, I thought that's something that people need to listen to. So when you talk about longevity, you 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 got to find a good fit, and and then you have got to be content, because as as uh, Scott Strickland has said, when I asked him to compare coaching in the SEC to coaching back in Ohio, and he said, man, he said. Uh, it was every bit as competitive as it is now. And, and so you can find something to fulfill that competitive nature you're looking for. But how many guys have we seen now? One guy, and I won't mention his name right now, but he was a guest so you guys can figure it out. But he, you know, he was a rising young star in the division one ranks. He was, he was not at one of the big colleges, but he was a rising young star and he was all set to become a head coach. He, he, I remember him calling me up when he said, I'm considering going back to high school. And he thought about it long and hard, made the decision. We had him on later on to talk about making that decision and how he went about that decision. I think that is something that's also uh, one of the episodes that I point to when I'm trying to get young coaches to say, what are the things I should be looking at here? And so he, he is not regretting his decision at all. And that's the hard part with with the path is everybody's path is completely different. And that's why it's hard to you can't really compare yourself to to what somebody else does because their family situation may be completely different. Their their life circumstances may be completely different. And so that's why it's hard to kind of recommend like, hey, it's not going to be, hey, if you do this, 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 and this, and then this is going to happen. It just doesn't work that way. So that's why you have to really focus on your own path and what you want out of life and the fulfillment that you want, because that may lead you to a, in a much different direction than somebody else. 
Well, Ryan, that's where he gets back again to what you touched on earlier, and that's about counselors and surrounding yourself. Don't just ask your buddies, okay? Don't don't just ask the guys who had graduated two years ahead of you and who are starting their own route. Talk to some people with varied backgrounds. Talk to people at the Division One, Two, Three level, NAIA, high school level, JUCO. Talk to them because you don't. Most twenty-one-year-olds do not even know what's uh, available to them out there, and they're All not they, supposed to know. I mean, no, at 20, not you're supposed not supposed to know at twenty-one. No, so that's why they turn on the TV and they see the game with LSU on there and think that's where I want to be. That's <laughs> why, and they don't think anything about again Millsaps College or, or or one of those schools like that. And and these guys have been there a long time for a reason. But I look at my own path, okay, because when, you know, growing up in Northwest Indiana near Chicago and, you know, with a a single mom, four kids she was raising, coaches filled a big void in my life. And that's the reason why I do what I do. But when I got to the high school level and went to college and I didn't go to college right away. I mean, I started college and I stopped and started, stopped and started. I finally got done by the time I was 29. Well, I had a corporate job and two kids at that point. And so I thought my dream early on was to be a high school teacher and coach basketball and baseball. Well, that was kind of derailed a little bit. But I say derailed, it just took a different course, actually, because then I ended up coaching for 20 years, uh, basketball and baseball. And I had a corporate job that provided me such flexibility. I never missed a practice, never I, I could go to work at 630 in the morning so that I could be at the field at uh, 245 and start raking. So those were, you know, it, it worked out for me. And I tell you, I, if you think about as Kevin Wilson talks about all, all the time and a lot of people do, but finding your why you really have to know why it is you're doing what you're doing. When I looked at why I wanted to coach young men, it, it it didn't matter that I was at a small private high school in central Illinois. Oh, what, and you know, small, a short time, Tennessee before that, what mattered was I was doing what it was that I wanted to do. How did you know when it was time to get out of corporate America? Um, well, they offered an early buyout. So that was, (laughs) that was, but you know what? I, I just knew, uh, it was, it was time. It was, I had spent plenty of time there and, and I just had other opportunities. So it, it, the door was open and I walked through it and I didn't look back. So uh, I, I could still be there today. Um, and you know what? It wasn't a bad job at all. Like I said, it provided me all kinds of flexibility. And so uh, it, was, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a bad gig. Do you have a fail forward moment? Do you have something that you thought was going to sidetrack you, but looking back now is one of the best things that happened to you? Yeah, I mean, probably uh, probably the whole thing about the coaching, because like I said, I, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. So going to college to me was all I wanted was to get the piece of paper in my pocket so that I could put that on my resume. That, that was it. And then I thought, well, now I don't get to coach, but I don't get to coach. And then all of a sudden, see, that's another thing when you're talking about 21, 22, 20, that you don't know. And as you say, you, you're not supposed to know yep. at that point. I didn't know. I thought you had to be a teacher to the coach, you know? So I'm thinking, well, I've lost my opportunity to coach. Next thing you know, I'm in coaching. And I get to coach my oldest son through high school and all that. Uh, I didn't know you could do those things. And then it's even more obvious today because schools are <coughs> screaming for coaches to, because they cannot get enough teachers to fill those positions. And so those opportunities are out there, not only at the schools, but in other organizations and things like that, where you can fill that need. And so what I thought was a failure early on uh, ended up being something that has provided the path to top coach. Do you have tips for coaching your, your son or daughter? I mean, you did it. Oh, Do you have tips for, for doing that? that? That's, that that's a great topic. And I, Oh, Ryan, you, you talk about s- something that I wish I would have counseled, you, taken some counsel on early on because my, my oldest son who played baseball, my youngest son did not play baseball. My oldest son 
is not cut out like me. He is not cut from the same cloth. He is so much like his mother. He was a good player. And he was, for a, for a kid with the 75 mile an hour fastball, he was surprisingly effective. But he was, he's not cut out like me. And that was my problem going in was thinking, well, because I was always the youngest kid in my class. I was always the shortest kid in my class. I didn't grow until I was like a junior or senior in high school. And I was hyper competitive. I mean, uh, and, and if they would have put me on the basketball court against the seven foot guy, I, that would is, yeah, let me add it. Let me, let me do this. Well, that that's my son wasn't cut out that way. And it took me a long time to figure it out. I wish I could do it all over again, but I had to institute a rule where it started when he was like in little league, you know, those rides home, ride homes that everybody's talking about. Uh, I instituted a rule. I said, Nope. You can't say anything about the game uh, for 24 hours, nothing. So it was hard for me. I want to tell him, you know, Brett, man, you know, that one inning, when you went up, you know, your approach when you were up at bat with that two and one count. Okay. No, no, no. He didn't want to hear it. Because number one, he didn't at that point he didn't care. He, he he was able to let it go where I wasn't. So you you really have to assess. You know, number one, there should be some rules in there. Period about talking to him and over coaching him and all that stuff. But the other thing is figure out what you what motivates your kid and why they're in what they're doing. For my son Brett, who was a good player, but. For him, it was a chance to be with his friends and to play a game that he liked, but he had no, he, he, he there were no, uh, he didn't have any objectives set about what he wanted to achieve and going to the next level and all that. And that was foreign to me and I had to dial it back. I had to dial it back. So have the ability, just like you do with assessing your coaching and your organization, step back and look at yourself from the outside, do a scouting report and see if you can figure out what is this situation? And what would I tell a father who came to me and asked about his son? And that will help you out a little bit. With your interviews, what are some other things that stuck out with some guests maybe that you hadn't thought of? Because there, there are things that pop up multiple times for me when I'm talking to, to guests now that I, I have a completely different perspective on things now because of the conversations we've had. But what are some other things that have stuck out about some of the guests that maybe you didn't think about before. Well, I think of a guy like Tony Robichaud who we lost yeah. way too early. And I always thought when I talked to him, he was one of those guys that said, if I had a division one son, a division one quality baseball playing son, he's one guy that I would entrust with my son for four years. It's guys like that who all of a sudden, you realize this is not about baseball at all. This is not about baseball. Yes. We're all in it because we love baseball. We're, you know, and we're not naive about that. You're not going to take a bunch of guys. Who is it? One of my favorite topics is with guys who are what I refer to as specialty schools. Okay. <laughs> like this Philadelphia school of the sciences. When I had that coach on who's, who's got a bunch of pharmacists. Okay. So you think, how do I assemble a team? And I think it was him. It might have been somebody else, who, but they said, I'm not looking for a bunch of pharmacists that want to play baseball. I'm looking for some baseball players who might want to be pharmacists. And, it, and there's your big distinction. But so I'm not naive about that. You know, if you're going to coach division one, even the division three level, you've got to have some stud athletes to play. But it's just like, what is every coach's lament? And how many times have you heard it, Ryan, where they say, uh, I, I feel like I need to go back and apologize to those guys I coached for the first three years? Yeah. Because it's guys like Tony Robichaud, who no doubt was, he, he would say the same thing about early on, he didn't really figure out what it was he was doing. But he proved that you could have a nationally contending program without forgetting about what the real core is, what you're doing, and what these guys are going to be doing for the 60 years beyond baseball. You know, so that's one thing. I, I get other guys on like John Altabelli. I had him on shortly before he died in that helicopter uh, accident with Kobe Bryant. And guys like that, 
when he would talk about some of the things that live in the life, you talk about work-life balance. He, he, he said, Jack, I'm living the life. It's kind of ironic now looking back on it, but he said, I'm living the life. He said, I'm living in Newport Beach. He said, I coach full-time at a junior college. And he said, you know, who could ask for anything more? Uh, it, it is amazing to me, the guys who are so driven, so su successful and have shown, have found ways to find contentment among a dog eat dog world. Yeah. Do you have any evening or morning routines that you like? I mean, you seem like a man of faith, but do you have any other routines that, that you go to that you feel like help you stay on top of things? No, it's funny you mentioned that because tomorrow's column, I'm actually releasing one, re-releasing one that I did a few years ago. And it has to do, with, it's called command the first part of your day yep. because that's so important. Um, you have got to have a routine in the morning or it'll get ahead of you. And let me just say one thing that ab absolutely screams at me, and this comes up with coaches all the time when they're talking about communication, that's don't read your email first thing. Once you start reading your email, all of a sudden they're in control of what you're doing. Th that comes later, but you have got to have a routine in the morning. My wife kind of laughs at me because she was talking about, yeah, yeah, she was wondering what I was doing because she gets up a little later than I do, but she laughs about my routine. But I mean, I do get up in the morning and I get the coffee maker going, you know, and I have the TV going in the background. I don't even pay attention to it, but I turn it on. And then, and then I go through a routine where I get my shower and all that other stuff. And then I read my Bible for a while, do a little prayer for a while in the morning. And then, you know, th those are things that once you establish that, once, you know, it's like digging into the batter's box. Once you establish that, you're kind of dictating that you're in control for the day. I remember there are, there are people who do it differently. Um, you know, it's like looking at your uh, to-do list for the day. So I like to create, whether I was in corporate world or now, that's one of the things I like to do early is make sure I look at my to-do list that I had finished up yesterday, reorganize it for the day. Dan McDonald talks about doing it the night before when he, before he goes to bed, that he'll do that then. But one of the things I love and it's why uh, is Barbara Corcoran, the, you know, on the shark tank, Barbara Corcoran, she talks about having a paper, a paper list because she said she likes the feeling of scratching something off with her pencil when it's done. And that that's part of the process as well. Cause that gives you the feeling of achievement, but yeah, those first two hours of the day are very, very important because it establishes what's going on and you got to make sure that you're in control. Any books? I mean, do you have favorite books? Ones that you go back to that you really like? Well, it, yeah, uh, there is one, uh, what's it called? Uh, never split the difference. And that is one with, uh, that is so, I'm trying to remember, can't remember the, the author, but he's been yeah. on Tim Ferriss's podcast. Uh, I, yeah. can't, I need to look, I'll look it up here. I'm going to look it up. Yeah. But that, that is a book. He was a former hostage negotiator. Okay. But it was the stories he tells are great just by themselves. It's Christopher Voss and, and Tal yeah. Raz. Yeah, there you go. And he he talks in there about one of the things that really stands out and one of the things that you will get as a out of it, no matter what position you're in, whether you're a podcaster, whether you're a baseball coach, whether you're a player, is how to identify other people. And, and, and then how to respond accordingly, because that, you know, when somebody's life is on the line, uh, then, you know, that is, it's, it's more important than some of the things that we do, but believe me, when you're sitting there with a player, when you're sitting there with the parents of a player, or you're sitting there with an administrator at your school, it's important to read them and respond, fashion your response accordingly. And that's one of the things he gets into. But I guarantee you, Ryan, I, I have given away that book at Love least it. 10 times. I've bought, I've purchased that book for at least 10 people. Every one of them have thanked me for that. That's how good a book it it's is. It's going on my and list. I, yeah, and a shout out to, 
to former guest Joe Ferraro because Joe, Joe is the Ferraro. man. Yeah, Joe has got a tremendous podcast. That is yeah. where I first heard about it. I think that was in his first handful of uh, podcasts that he did. But Joe, yeah, still coaching up there in New York. And Joe is one of the all-time good guys. And everybody who listens will hear his little – that's him on the tagline in the beginning where he said, uh, every coach has a story. That's, that's Joe. So shout out to Joe for doing many things for me. What are some final thoughts or there's something I should have asked that I didn't? Um, I, well, that's a good question. Really. I think you, you've done a good job of covering it, but I, I'll tell you what it is whether you're a podcaster, whether you're a young coach, whether you're a seasoned coach is always, always look out there for the next thing it, look for new ideas don't ever get stale I think because you wonder often how can a coach who's been at this place for 20 years how, how's it program seems to get flatlined and that's because some guys don't know when to call it a day and th because they're done and you know who was it the other day said uh who did I just interview um but he said if, if uh well, now, now you got now two I'm, options there. I think about this a lot. Like you, you have to try to re-engage where you're at, or you have to go find another job. Like that's your only two yeah. options. Like you have to re-engage where you're at, or you have to go find another job. Yeah, uh, it was Matt Noon. Yep. So you know, you you know, Coach Matt, he's awesome. Yeah, awesome. he he said if you think you figured out recruiting, then you're, you're probably past your prime or something like that. <laughs> but the, the, the point he's getting at is like with anything that we do is you've always got, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the downside of things here, but you know, I, I'm always looking for new ideas. And I think what keeps me fresh is the people I talk to every day. And so don't fall into so much of a routine to where you're not open to new ideas all the time. Try to put yourself into a position, whether it's talking to young guys, whether it's engaging with people at your baseball camp, whether it's going to the convention and finding a couple young guys to talk to, because just like I've discovered every week that I'm going to, I'm learning more from them than they're learning from me. That is the honest truth. Uh, the, uh, one young coach that I talked to recently, when we got done, he said, man, I took a page and a half of notes after we were done talking for 45 minutes. And I said, I have a page of notes sitting here and it's stuff that I can use. So be open to fresh ideas, be open to learning, find ways to do that. Not as a drudgery, but as something you look forward to doing. You don't have to start a podcast, but you can find entertaining ways of getting new ideas and fresh ideas all the time. Jack, thanks for everything that you've done for baseball. It's tremendous. Thanks so much for coming on for me to, with me. And so I'll, I'll see you in Nashville. Absolutely, Ryan. I appreciate the work you're doing, man, and keep it up. I know that uh, if it's anything like me, it's probably not a day you don't look forward to coming into work. For sure. For sure. Thank you, sir.